Greetings and salutations, our fine podcast audience. We are glad you are back with us. Ed, yep. Nathan, how you doing? I got food in my mouth. I'm telling you. I so am feeling that I'm pretty about good to about put myself. In my mouth. I thought I would just let all of y'all experience it with me. We have, why don't y'all tell them what it is while I taste it? Our great friend Michael Laidlaw has stopped by and blessed us with another vegan dish. Mm. From uh, the, the organization, the company, the fabulous. Fabulous. Good food, good fuel. Fabulous. And I'll just say, if you taste this, you would have to say, Chef Michael Laidlaw. Yeah, he's a chef. Yeah, this yes, is sir. not just our friend. This is Chef is Michael chef. Laidlaw. And you have, to, you have to do that thing where you, whatever ah, that's called. You have whatever to, that is. You have to kiss, is it? Two fingers and a thumb or three fingers? I don't know. Well, I have to ask Chef Michael I, Laidlaw, mm. when I kiss my fingers directed towards you, mm. how would you prefer I kiss my fingers? So l- let me tell I watch him. a lot of cooking shows. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Not because I cook, but because I like food. You like food. And so I know that when you're judging food, at some point, if you really like it, you go, mm. is that coriander in there <laughs> it's you a know, specific some, coriander you say something that i don't know what, an ingredient you don't it, know about is is that salt yeah <laughs> let me say I'm, I'm i'm getting hints of i think the word is salt uh, <laughs> i believe oh, no, i not, say something but, that, but i'll say that not on not with this no 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 there is some sophisticated stuff going on he has he has a i'll, I'll just go ahead and tell you it, this is a vegan mac and cheese yeah, uh-huh. Michael's a vegan he chef. He called it Mac and V. Mac and V. Mac and V. And uh, we all, I uh, think, are in agreement. This is pretty dang good. It yep. may be, yep. and I'll just say, it's it may be my favorite uh, mac and cheese. I'm telling I agree. you. There's I, so I'll much going down. on. And, and not to be like, you know, I'm going to sound like a wine connoisseur, like you just said, but there's a lot going on in here. Yes. Oh yeah, there's there's a full on flavor fest. There's all kinds of flavors hitting me, and and the deeper I get into it, the more I'm getting them. So well, and I not uh, to mention Joel first. Uh, Joel also is eating off, yes. over on the side. He said it's not as fat. It doesn't feel as it's heavy. It's not heavy at all. It doesn't feel heavy. Yeah, most of the time you're eating mac and cheese, you know, with especially this much, you know, you're gonna roll out of here. But I mean, it's very there's a lot light. of flavor. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of flavor. Put a clock on my chest. Call me Flavor Flav. Yeah. There's a lot of flavor in this. I'm going to say this. <laughs> I love that reference, Nathan. But uh, but very cheesy. You would love that reference. That's right in your, that's right in your time slot. It is, man. Right. <laughs> flavor, flavor, right? The, you know, the birth of hip-hop and all that. There you go. That was when I was coming up as a young pup. So, um, as a young hip hop artist yourself. That's right. Oh, that was me. You can look at me. Look at me. He you was, know I was. Well, but 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 Public Enemy in did. the hood that is Rootville. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Public Enemy played that little line there though, where they do have they did have some metal stuff going on. They did some songs they with did. Anthrax, and they, they did. did. They yeah, did. So they we have... had no idea what fight the power meant. No. <laughs> mom, fighting you, mom. It, it. it turns out you were the power. Yeah, that was. <laughs> yeah, that, that Elvis was a hero to some, not to me, mom. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Oh, man. Okay. So, back Jason to, then got warmed up. I got hot there. I had to, I had to lose this the mac heat. and cheese. This <laughs> mac and V. I'm, I'm in love. Um, so let's let's tell him about. Uh, we don't want to not advertise Michael because right. he's we been gotta, so nice. He didn't Mike. he didn't make us do it. He no. didn't say we said we wanted to. No, you just wanted to bless us with some delicious mac and v. But Michael is doing online cooking classes on Zoom on Zoom uh, through his Facebook page. Good and food. Good food. Good food. He said if you just good search food, good, good fuel. Good fuel. Yeah. Good food, good fuel. You search that, you should be able to find it. We're also going to put links, and the assuming he sends it to us, we're going to have the recipe to this yummy mac and I'm cheese. A, I'm, a, I'm expecting it because I. You just, should take it to your Thanksgiving. That's what I was going to say. My wife and I are supposed to be uh, providing some mac and cheese. They're going to uh, secretly take it to their. Uh, I'm telling you, you don't tell anybody. You don't tell. They no, I don't know. think anyone would know. And then I can tell. And them we they, know that no one in your wife's family is watching the podcast. So no. <laughs> I would be very shocked if they did. Then this would be like the first time I found out. But yeah, I think I think if you are um, if if you are cooking for anybody who is uh, has a bias against veganism or mm-hmm. vegetarian, which I think many of us do, we naturally hear that and we go. Uh, I hate vegetables. I hate them. <laughs> the only vegetable I eat is chicken. That's the closest to a vegetable I get. Red meat all the way. Nice. Um, if that's where you're at, then uh, I don't think you would know. I don't oh, no. think you would know, you and it's and then you would be shocked. 
and uh, you might have an, an as epiphany. somebody on our staff the other day say if you if you don't include the meat everything's vegetarian that's true. That's brilliant. <laughs> that I mean, so brilliant. It, I, mean, I think several of us said, uh, uh, yeah. yeah. Kind of. <laughs> yeah that would be like that, the definition. Exactly. I, oh, well. guess, I guess it would be more of a revelation if you were doing like a meat lover's pizza. If you're a, if you're a multiple but meats All I want to say is if you don't count the meat of a meat lover's pizza, the rest might be considered be vegetarian. Yes, vegetarian. <laughs> Not vegan. Not vegan. Not vegan. Yes. Yeah. Close. Okay. So there. All right. So, have we, so have you we, can either use this recipe or just never count any meat you eat i also like that michael trusts us to be experts to talk about what vegetarian or veganism is like we yeah. would have any idea of what and, to say and the good news is michael is a regular listener of the podcast yes, he'll so correct it just he can correct, correct it all in the said. in the comments he'll be in the comments he can just correct it so that's awesome okay so, and Tammy, we hear she's yes. the baker. Maybe oh, maybe yes. Tammy would yeah uh, bake us something. Make a, she's a baker. She could bake us something without eggs. I heard that's what he said today. You gonna right. bake something without eggs? I'm I'm interested in that. I, idea. I think that should be our next thing, Michael. Let's do it. All right, bring it on. All right. So while we're um, we've just now committed his wife <laughs> to, to be a part of this. Okay, so but she probably doesn't listen, and she'll just say no. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. She'll feel fine saying no. <laughs> So this brings up a discussion that I was going to have. I did not know we were going to be eating, but I was thinking, you know, this is Thanksgiving coming up next week. Um, what are your favorite Thanksgiving foods and what are the ones you hate? Because we're about to go and probably encounter these next week. All right. So I'm going to say what my favorite is, and this is a recent favorite Uh Nathan's brother, uh, John, has a Brussels sprout. It's weird mm. that you refer to your son as my brother. <laughs> it's just weird. I'm going to disown him right here. Way to do that. John, Nathan's brother, and, <laughs> and my son. It's just a weird way to introduce somebody. It, it was. I don't know why I said it that way. I understood it. If I you could was, have said it this way. You know the guy in the office next to Jason, John. I guess you could have. <laughs> the only reason you might like is if he was royalty or like the president. And you might say, the President of the United States, also my son. <laughs> anyway, he makes a Brussels sprouts thing that I only get at Thanksgiving. Yeah. yeah. I love Brussels sprouts anyway, but his is exceptional. Is it a casserole or? No. They do something with, yeah. I don't know what it is. I, you're you're trusting the two wrong people. I take people it it's more than just it Brussels on sprouts. The I see it, I eat it. I say, I'm saying it, um, it's more than just Brussels sprouts. It, well, it's Brussels sprouts, and then they kind of they, they season it. I think there might be even, like... I want to say bacon. I was going to say bacon, I, In too. my mind, I want to say bacon is with it. Oh, there you go. It's and, hard. You're asking the two wrong people to be able to give you any kind of... I, I, whatever I say, and you all both know John very well, know... Uh -huh. I can't say anything you say right. right. No, Beyond you're not going to you're not going to get the ingredients. Other right. than that, it was good. There it was go. good. All right. I could say whatever I want because he another, also is another non-listener. He's, <laughs> not, he's not watching this. Um, yeah, there's a lot of stuff I will say that both John and his wife Sarah make that are absolutely delicious and probably i very much look forward to they feed our family yeah but none of the stuff they do is what i would even call very traditional they make a sweet potato casserole which is really good but they're both very creative in the way that they cook so they they don't cook what i would consider mostly very traditional things if i had to say traditional i probably would say like a sweet potato casserole i love mm -hmm. sweet potato casserole i do too mm -hmm. um and and you don't really get it any other time of the year and so i'm excited everything else that i don't get the rest of the year i go i understand why i'm not eating this the rest <laughs> of the year this all turkey by and large i understand i would even go this i know most people are ham is that way for me really ham, i'm a ham guy i, I like ham. ham oh me too but love ham i like I would if you had pork chops, ham, bacon together. Ham's the last of those. Oh, okay. not not for me. Honey baked ham oh, yeah. or mm -hmm. any of that spiral cut. Any mm -hmm. even is not. I'll just slice it off. I Whatever. I love baked ham. Yeah, I'm, I'm not a ham guy, so none of that. None of the none of the broccoli and cheese casserole. It's all fine. I'm never upset to eat it, but I always go. I never leave. I know even people who are that way. My wife's that way with dressing. She's like, oh, I love dressing. I was going to say that's my favorite. Okay. Is it really? Yours. Well, Is and I'll tell you why. cornbread? It, well, any kind, really. But um, we have uh, friends of ours that we spend every other Thanksgiving with. And this year is our year to spend Thanksgiving with these friends. And uh, um, 
she cooks a dressing and she makes it out of this special sausage. Um, my friend Amanda, if you're watching, uh, she's not. But anyway, she uh, she grew up in Alabama and there's this uh, sausage factory called it's in Conecuh, Alabama, and they make this sausage. You can get it around here. So it has roadkill in it. Since pretty it's much from Alabama. Pretty much, <laughs> and it it is the best smoke. It's like a smoked sausage, and it is the best smoked sausage I've ever had. But she bakes it into her dressing. Oh wow! It's phenomenal sounds good i could just sit and make a meal out of it so that has become one of my favorite thanksgiving okay. uh items so are we're there, gonna have that. are there desserts that you eat i i you and my mom always would have pumpkin pie which i'm fine with but she'd mm, also have an egg away. custard pie that's good. yeah and that's one of my all-time favorite do like we custard. don't have that anymore but i i'm a pecan pie guy i like custard pie i like, I like pecan pie I but it's it. not a big deal i do, I do too I just, honestly there's not a pie i don't like I, I, a pie over cake generally. Me too. Pie over there cake are for me too. cakes, but pie over cake in general. I think ice cream also goes better with pie than cake. Of course it does. So, ice cream could go with anything. Dressing, it, can, it goes with dressing. With ice, cream, <laughs> yeah, with ice cream and cake, ice cream becomes the feature. And somehow with pie, they enhance one another. Mm. Well, that was one thing we did by girls when we went to uh, we went on a vacation to Myrtle Beach just a couple months ago. I don't know how it came up, but one of them said that they don't like pie. And I said, one, you've never had pie, and two, that's impossible. So we went and bought even just a store-bought pie and bought some ice cream, and we took it down to the beach, and we had we had ice cream and pie on the beach at sunset, and it was wonderful. So, Very cool. Yeah. So, so you awesome. had pie and ice cream and sand. Yeah. In, in the pie. <laughs> in the in pie and the ice cream. Yeah, Because yeah, if you're on the beach, but, sand's and everything. Yeah, exactly. Yes. Okay. Well, again, thank you, Michael, and good food, good fuel. Yes, please very, go good very, food, very. good fuel. This is good food and good fuel. So, all right, let's get on to the more serious fare. Uh, y'all, y'all serious. This was pretty darn serious. It huh? was it serious. Is. It's serious mac and V. That's so, right. I but, just had lunch, too, so I'm, I'm going to stop, stop or yeah, I will I overeat. Stop, yeah. All right. So, all right. So, um, reason we're bringing up this question is because uh, Nathan is up this week. He's going to be uh, preaching, this week, teaching yeah. this week at our uh, experiences online and on site. Um, and he's going to actually going to be bringing up a question, but you didn't have time to answer it. So and we're it's gonna, not at the forefront of the message. Yes. No, it's more of a, a tangent. Yeah, but we're going to answer it. So uh, if you're here because you already watched, because it's weird, the time thing. But <laughs> if yeah. you've already watched this and you've come here to see this answer, that that's where that this came from. But um, so do you want to set this up? You want me to ask it or you good? Well, why don't you just ask it? Okay. Mm-hmm. So the question uh, that we're going to tackle is this. And a lot of people ask this question. Uh, does... The theory of evolution disprove the biblical account of creation because mm-hmm. a lot of people you know think there's there's a, there's a, there's a and or, there's a versus kind of thing it's you either believe one right. or the other but you can't have both yes and i guess the quick answer to that and we'll get into uh, more of this count to three and then we'll all give the answer yes one two three no, no. the answer is no so it doesn't disprove it uh, but let's talk about why, because a lot of people don't quite understand. Nor does that. the the reverse is true. Neither nor does the biblical account of creation disprove evolution. Exactly. Neither Absolutely. one is trying to go at the other. There they you. aren't. They aren't trying to deal with the same question. Yes. Right. And so I think that's. I'll just say that as somebody who has who has helped, uh, who has worked in youth ministry primarily, and a big part of I saw my job was once they left youth ministry, being actively involved with college students and people of that this is one of the number one what i would call ideological reasons people actually once again i'll say people who went who go to college this is one of the biggest things that actually makes them turn a little bit from their faith Mm. this and i'd say maybe what's referred to as like the problem of evil are the two big things if you say ideological there's lots of other reasons that people tend to walk away but when it comes down to ideas that conflict in their head um, and I think it's because the way it's posited by many Christians and by many people in the science field is that these two things are at odds. Mm-hmm. That if you're going to believe a scientific account of the creation of the universe, including things like evolution and things of that nature, then you can't believe the Bible because the Bible says that didn't happen. Mm-hmm. And people who are on the Christian side go, well, you can't believe that theory of how the world came about because the Bible said it didn't happen. The Bible didn't say it didn't happen, and that's not even the point of the verses that people are looking at when they talk. And 
I also think it's important to say when people talk about the biblical account of creation, there's not just one. That's right. I, was, I always ask people, which one are you talking about? Yes, yeah. there are multiple. There are obviously the Genesis account, but even in Genesis, there are two in the first in the it first two chapters. It kind of goes back over it again. Yeah. Yes. And, and it's a little different. Yeah, there's some in Psalms. There's one <laughs> yeah, in Job. Right. There's one. I mean, and it's just several times it's mm-hmm. brought up. Um, so but when, every time, I'll, I'll say this and then we can go. Every time... It is in what's referred to as poetic form. Uh, it's written in, from the point of very figurative language. It's painting a picture of something, not necessarily a play-by-play scientific description. Doesn't mean that you can't take it as a play-by-play scientific description. The only point is that was not what it was intended to be read well, as. Well, and if you do, you you do run into some problems. And let's just be honest. I mean, and and we were having this discussion as we were setting this up. Um, the truth is, and I hear a lot of Christians, you know, they want to stand on. I, I take the Bible literally, and they mean, you know, word for word, kind of the yeah. description you just said. And I and I've I've had this discussion with people. I I just believe what Genesis tells me, and. I, and I get why they're saying that, but the truth is you don't because there are always parts of it that you, even the people that say they take it literally don't take literally. They, they're they still, and there's, so my point when I talk to those people is, you know, you, you already take some of this figuratively. That's You're, right. There are just others that take other parts figuratively. Right. And so you've got, you've picked and choose what you're taking figuratively. And so, so at least be intellectually <laughs> honest. You know what I'm saying? Uh, you can, you can be a follower of Jesus and be what you would call the young earth creationists who sure. believe, you know, in the seven day, 24 hour cycles or what they call an old earth creationist, you know, which they take, of course, that word day, there's some debate on how you can interpret that's that. That's right. That yeah, word. Sure. And, and, we and all, that's how people get, it. I'm either a young earth creationist, yeah. which means I believe the whole earth less than 10,000 years mm-hmm. old, mm-hmm. or I'm an old earth creationist. They're they're lengthening days at exactly. certain point exactly to try to to try to take some scientific evidence that they want to take mm-hmm. and put in. Mm-hmm. I, it all comes down to they're answering different questions. Yes, science is not trying to answer who because when it comes down to it, everything goes back to a point and somebody go, and everybody admits it all started at a point. Right. That's, yeah. that's the best and science, science has we, proven that. Now. That's right. Right now, that's the best science. And again, there may come something beyond that because at every point, yeah. science is always trying to disprove itself. Exactly. Science I mean, it's by always, its nature is evolving it, on that. Sense, that's right. It is it's constantly learning. looking at everything and saying, is there something beyond that? But right now they see a singular point that everything started. Well, Christianity says the same thing. Exactly. Well, and isn't it interesting that at one point in, in recent history, in the last hundred years, that idea that many people now get to, and I'll say many Christians are afraid of, of the term of like Big Bang, that mm-hmm. there was an initial event that created the universe. That it originally was actually helpful to believers right, because yes. it used to be believed in what was referred to as like a static universe, that the universe has just always been. Mm-hmm. Right, that's, that's what right. many scientists believe. And what I'll say is many non-faith-based side. Many people who, who at that time were saying one of the proofs that there is no biblical account of creation is the universe wasn't created. It's That's just right. always been. And then the, when they when they found that and the Big Bang Well, and they theory, had this idea that the universe is expanding, so mm-hmm. that meant for it had a start place, they understood, oh, and the, the term that you know came out of that was if there's a Big Bang, there's a Big Banger, that there's be. somebody who initiated. But now <laughs> what has happened, what I find funny is I'll regularly talk with Christians who are um, – a kind of uh, what I would say very young earth creationists that will say and they use the Big Bang as there is no Big Bang and I want to say to them no the Big Bang helps our biblical yes. account of creation and so I think all of that confusion and the reason I'm, I bring that up it's not just a little nuanced point to me it shows that it's gone beyond people who who have lost the narrative of what we're talking about it shows we have in many ways just turned this into turf wars mm. over because the big bang now i know many christians and many people scientists go well you don't believe in the big bang and i go no we do because the nature of that says we've we- been saying that for the whole time well <laughs> the christians have always said that the universe was created out of nothing right. and just as you just mentioned nathan just in the last hundred years or so yes. science has said the universe was created out of nothing that's right so now where we're at we're all in agreement on that it's just what was behind that a lot of 
atheists and and people who are kind of not warmed up to the idea of God yet (laughs) would say, well, we just haven't figured out how something comes from nothing. Yes. We believe that the energy behind that. That's right. We believe that nothing can create something which currently, no, we don't know that. We just have to. And as you and I said, that's a faith statement right there. Yeah. But Christians all along have said, well, no, there was nothing but God because God's eternal. God made something out of nothing. And so now anybody who tells you, well, you know, nothing can create something. They're just not just making it up. They're they're making an assumption. Well, again, we both tend to creep over into each other's territory. Mm -hmm. And I have done that in my 40 something years now of being a Christian. I have been at several of these positions along the line and find, until finally, as a person who likes to read and study, I began to study and the, read this stuff in science, and I go, okay, that has a I mean, everybody who really has looked at it says this is true. Mm-hmm. Right. So now I just look at it and go, oh, that's, they're talking about how this happened. The Bible's only talking about who made it happen the bible was never trying to answer how it was answering who and so i know one of the verses you're going to talk about that a lot of christians miss out on is that in the new testament a lot of people talk well god created god's the creator well the new testament makes clear jesus is the name Mm. of the god who was the creator which is a problem a lot of christians don't even realize that's where you're going to get to this Mm -hmm. that jesus is the author of this john makes that clear paul makes that clear so they're just even refining who between Old and New Testament right. clear, but it's still, they're, they're working on the same question of who. So now anytime there's a new scientific discovery, I just go, oh, that's how he did it. Yeah. But mm-hmm. when a scientist gets back all the way to what they know and they say, okay, this is where we know, and then they begin to say, but there can't be a who, mm-hmm. Let's just be clear. They have stepped over, like we have stepped into their realm often and said, this is how he did it. Mm -hmm. They have now stepped into the philosophical end and said, there isn't a who. Who is not a scientific answer. Exactly. Well, and I think that's important. And I know there are a lot of great Christian scientists who are, who are working on this. Well, I should say scientists who are Christian because, uh, anyway, uh, there are a lot of, there are a lot of scientists who are Christian, like Francis Collins, who we watched a, uh, interview with of about a month or so ago, who's the head of the National Institute of Health and worked on the Human Genome Project and all this different kinds of stuff. And he's on a part of the Biologos Foundation Yeah, he created that. He created created Biologos. Which I was going to say. this specific question. Yes. And which I was going to say, if you want articles to read about this, that's where you go. Just look up Biologos and their website. And for those of you who are still trying to figure this out and you aren't sure about God and the who question, you should know that Francis Collins was on your side right. as he mapped the human genome. And, I mean, I don't know. You may be right there with him scientifically. I am not. He's done. He has much more <laughs> discipline in that area and study than I have. And it was in study in that area that he came to believe there is a who, there is an intelligence yep. uh, behind this, and it's no longer, it's not even intelli- it's not uh, intellectually sound for me to say there is no who. And I think it's important, I think this question is important, that's one thing I, I end up talking with people about, not just to like um, build up your own faith, I'm not by my nature, I love things were referred to as apologetics, which is just defensive faith. And so answering kind of questions around those things by my nature, that's not the number one thing that's interesting to me. I don't think this is just an issue of, well, can I even believe in the Bible? I think there is a, there is a, at its core, a story, um, and I'm going to be talking about this on Sunday. This is the central to my sermon on Sunday. But the stories that we end up telling ourselves about the world, uh, they form ourselves and they form what we think is possible. And I think one of the reasons many of us fail to follow everything Jesus commanded is because we are telling ourselves a story that what Jesus commands us to do is impossible for us to do uh, because we just have poorly formed imaginations. The way our imaginations work is there's a way this world operates and the people who get ahead have to do certain things to get ahead. You know, we answered a question before that says, 
Isn't there coming a time where uh, good people are going to have to do bad things? Well, that's a story you're telling that's yourself. That's right. Mm. You're telling yourself a story that everybody, if they're going to survive, is going to have to do certain kinds of things. And there are exceptions to times where I don't have to be loving or submissive or gentle or kind. And I don't have to do those things at that point because I need to do the bad thing to get. Well, all of that is a story you're telling yourself. And the same is true when it comes to how did the universe come to be? How did human beings come to be? What does God think about our planet? How does he think about our responsibility to care and to love for one another and for our planet and for the creatures on this planet? If the story you tell on either side uh, does not include what is the true, what I would say is the, the, the essence behind the biblical account, which is that God created, and as you mentioned, which is true, Jesus is the creative force behind everything in existence, and when he created it, it was good. But also, it wasn't fully complete because he brought humans in to work alongside him and to do things. And so just because it was good didn't mean that it was done and that Mm -hmm. he wants us to be active and caring for one another and caring for We are a part of the overall plan, and we always were. We always were, yes. And that when Jesus, and this is where we get to in the Sermon Sunday, when Jesus dies and rises from the dead, he says— I'm bringing a new creation with me that I'm recreating everything and ju- but not like as you just said that was the plan from the beginning I'm bringing people to do it mm-hmm. but he works through us and so the story you tell yourself it affects how you treat people how you treat our planet how you treat uh, the everything God's created including it, yourself absolutely I, would say. I I think one of the real I think one of the things that's become evident to me over time is how much lack of purpose people have when they don't tell themselves the right story mm-hmm. that I was created by God on purpose for for a purpose. Yeah. And that my purpose is determined by him and he's told us what our purpose is. My mm-hmm. purpose is to love people and to love God and I have to whatever whatever job I have right. isn't my purpose. Right. Whatever thing I'm good at is not my purpose. Yeah. And when I don't tell myself that right story, that in the end, it does impact how I treat myself, Mm -hmm. how I treat you, how I look at God, how I look at the world. And the closer I can get to telling myself that right story, the more my life is going to be in harmony. And I won't be purposeless like a lot of people. I I really just sense, and I talk to people, they don't know what they're what yes. they're trying to do. Well, yeah. and the other part of it is it frees me from one. It gives me a purpose for my, but it puts my purpose in context that I'm not the purpose. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And that, because for most of us, I become the purpose. And for, for many people, that's where a lot of their anxiety comes from. A lot of their depression comes from, because if I'm the purpose and I'm supposed to be the best I can be, it don't take any of us very long to figure out I'm not the best I can be and I have no plan to become the best. And there are people who are doing better than me. There are people who are succeeding. I feel like a failure. I feel like I'll never catch up because I'm the purpose. And you know, one of the one of the beauties of the biblical account of creation, every time it's repeated, is the reminder that I'm not the purpose of this. That when I was created, I enter into a story that's greater. Every I talked about last week, I have a prayer meeting every morning, and part of our prayer meeting every morning is I remind me and the people who do it that we begin by reminding ourselves our story is greater than ourselves and we pray this thing where it's lord let my soul rise to meet you as the day rises to meet the sun just like it does every day whether i'm here or not the day rises to meet the sun glory to the father the son the holy spirit as it was in the beginning is now and will be forever this story was came before me it's going i get to participate in i have a purpose to participate right now but it's going on after my time is done and I get to join in the greater story for eternity. I think that is a beautiful thing. So when we talk about this question, I do think the question matters, but as as Ed and Jason have both said too, the how is not as important as the who and the why. Wow, who would have thought we'd have gotten into all that out of the evolution question? (laughs) There you go. Well, and as Jason and I were talking about this earlier on a different subject, I always come down with people, what you decide on how, I don't know how you answer that question, how it impacts you loving God and loving people. So whether you're a young earth person yes, sure. or you're a, a, a theistic evolution person, where, where, wherever you are on this scale, 
I don't know how practically it impacts that. So That's make right. a decision, yep. read, don't get locked in because you, if you get too locked in, you will violate the only two commands that he yes. that Jesus said mattered. Yep. Loving God and loving people. Mm-hmm. Yep. yep. Keep your eye on the ball. Okay. So uh, today we're going to do something. It, it, I think this might be a first for our podcast. Um, we're going to uh, we're going to kick to an interview that we that Nathan just did recently with yep. one of uh, someone who's becoming a great friend to our church. Yep. Mm-hmm. And uh, Ed, I'm going to let you introduce uh, this interview. Yeah, we want you all to. Uh, we're really trying to get people to to meet and know Derek Teagle. You know, uh, we started this year talking about uh, racial reconciliation and how to make a difference in that in our community. We can't do everything, but we can do something. And I personally began to pray about God leading me to people that we could begin to partner with in that community. And along the way, uh, God uh, arranged where I would hear from Derek, uh, hear his story. I realized that he and I had had a crossing of paths years ago when he was a young man. And uh, so uh, we're beginning to partner with him. Nathan introduced him to both our online and in uh, on-site gatherings on Sunday. But just in case you missed that interview, we want to make sure you get to know Derek and his incredible story and how you can begin to partner with him because we hope uh, this is going to begin a long, fruitful partnership for us in the difference that we can make in Coweta County together in racial reconciliation and in just bringing the kingdom of God to bear in our community. So let's kick to this interview uh, with Derek. All right. See you guys next week. I am uh, right now in a Google Meet uh, with a um, a, a man here in our our county who right here in Coweta County that is making a Jesus kingdom size difference right here. Uh, His name is Derek Teagle. He is um, he runs an organization here called Empowered for Life, and it is an awesome organization. But instead of me telling you about it, I want to introduce you to, to Derek. So, Derek, go ahead and say hey to everybody. Hey, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Derek Tugel, director of Empowered for Life, a local nonprofit organization that has been established since 2007. 2007. What what got you? Tell us a little bit about what kind of inspired uh, you to, to start Empowered for Life. What what and, and really what you do at Empowered for Life? Basically, what started it, <clears throat> I was doing a group Bible study at Noonan Hospital with some people, and we decided to read the book, A Purpose Driven Life. And after I got finished reading the book, I knew my purpose was to mentor students. Um, so we started out with mentoring three students, crazy long story with that, but basically we started out with three students mentoring, and those three students went from three to 20, word of mouth, add more kids. The next component we did was to start doing physical training with students. So instead of doing mental training, we did uh, physical training with students and started a thing called a Empire for Life training session, which basically includes a two-hour workout uh, hour where we devoted to physical training, uh, 30 minutes devoted to mental training, and 30 minutes devoted to spiritual training. Uh, And that's where our base for the first year. Uh, The second year, we added recruiting of high school athletes to help them get college scholarships. Uh, That was year two. Uh, Year three, we added seminars, and we still do these seminars. We do four seminars a year to educate our youth. Uh, the fifth year, we added college tours. And based on college tours, that we take 15 college tours per year. We take kids to different colleges. Some of them are same-day trips. Some of them are two-day trips. Some of them are weekend trips. So we give them a chance to get outside of their, their community. Uh, the last component that we added six years ago was the giving component, where our students give to the community. We give our time, and also we give our resources back to the community. Uh, one of the things that we're working on right now is a Giving Tuesday campaign. So instead of us receiving funding for Giving Tuesday, we're going to give to a local nonprofit organization called Sleep in Heavenly Peace, where we're fundraising currently right now uh, to give money to them to help build beds. Not only are we only going to give money to them, we're going to help build the beds and deliver the beds to students in Coyote County. That's awesome. That's awesome. And for, for those of you here uh, who are joining in, in, in you're a longtime community Christian people, you know, this is right at the heart of, 
of really who we are as a church is uh, trying to empower, and I love that's right in the name of the uh, right in the name of the organization, empower uh, students and people to to live the kind of lives that God intended them to live. And and I know you're, you're doing that right here in com- uh, right here in Coweta County and in communities here that uh, desperately need it. And um, Derek, has it been your experience for for many of the the students that you're mentoring that that this has been a, a life changing like an eye opening kind of experience for them as well. Yes, because we um, we don't care where you come from. Uh, we don't care your uh, religious affiliation, political affiliations. Uh, we don't care you're from the hood. We don't care you're from the suburbs. Our good thing is that we can help maximize gifts through the Word of God. But also, we run a no excuse organization, so everyone in our organization is treated the same, and I mean it. Um, I don't care you're a star athlete. I don't care you're just a student that's love love to read. Our goal is to help maximize the gifts of our students. So some of our kids are athletes. Some of our kids are not athletes. Uh, but our goal is to find what your gifts are and help you maximize those gifts. Uh, one of the great things about our organization is that we got 30 students that went through the organization. They are 30 and under. They are currently business owners in our community. Uh, the reason why I like to share that, that story is that we maximize the gifts. So we, whatever your gifts are, a lot of the world want to focus on your flaws, which we all have flaws. Our goal is to focus on your gifts. And once we focus on your gift, now we, we can talk about those flaws. But our focus, main focus is on your gifts first. Uh, we're not going to be part of the world where we focus on your flaws or your mistakes or things you did in the past. Because one thing about me, I've done it all in the past. I was sharing it with a group of kids yesterday in Manchester, Georgia. The only thing I probably haven't done in my life was cocaine. Everything else I probably have done. Uh, but that's my past. I'm not currently smoking weed. I'm not currently drinking. I'm not currently cheating on my taxes. I'm not currently, but I just do all of those things. You know, so I have a past. Uh, also, I have a present. And one thing I tell our kids is that as long as I'm trending in the right direction, it's an expectation I have for you guys to trend in the right direction, not the wrong direction. Uh, I, I love that. And so Derek's going to tell you in just a moment here about an opportunity you have uh, to make a difference as well. Um, like many of you know, or if you're brand new to our church, you may not know, uh, we believe that life is best lived under Jesus' central command, which is to love everyone always. And what's a better way to get to love students here in our community than to get to be a part of helping to mentor them and to coach them and to get to just come alongside them. And like Derek just said, so great, which is, man, that's the heart of our church right here is, hey, everyone's got a past, but God has a future for you. God has a plan for your life. And so what a better way to say that uh, to people than for you to get to be involved. So, Derek, um, I know that uh, you've got an opportunity for, for people in our church to get to, to volunteer with you guys and get to help. So tell us a little bit about this opportunity you have uh, for, for our church. I will. But before I get to that, one of the things that I love about your church, even before I entered, was the sign outside where it says no perfect people allowed. I love that sign because that's definitely a direct of who I am. God knows I'm not perfect. <laughs> God knows I'm not. Um, but to understand that, yes, quote unquote, we do have a past, but we still can grow from our past. And so I love your sign on your shirt uh, that says no perfect people allowed because I felt good coming in there knowing that it's not perfection is expected. Um, but we'll say this, what we're doing right now, be part of a, a four part seminar series that we're doing called Connecting the Dots. And what we, we Connecting the Dots is, is talking about race relations as well as talking about uh, law enforcement officers, how can we be friends? How can we have really good dialogue with our law enforcement officers? Because I never want to live in a world, including my own community, where people are not respecting law enforcement officers, but also um, that I can live without law enforcement officers. We need them. Um, one thing I want to share with that is that um, many, many years ago, I did not respect law enforcement officers. And what has happened is over the time that I got with the city of Noonan, I got with the County County Sheriff Department, and we have developed a relationship that now is so strong that we can have true dialogue. That don't mean we always going to agree, but true dialogues between each other. So we branch off on connecting the dots and do a thing called connecting the community. And what this is that for middle school and high schoolers, we're going to have middle school and high school kids come out every Saturday for five Saturdays. And we're going to play basketball. Um, so for five Saturdays, we're going to play basketball. We're going to split them on teams. And we're asking for people to be uh, volunteer coaches, volunteer referees, and also volunteer servers. Uh, servers include serving meals to kids once we're done playing basketball. But if you're a coach, not only you get a chance to coach the kid, you get a chance to, once you're not coaching, to hang out and talk to the kids while you're not coaching. 
Following that, we go into the lobby and we eat uh, lunch together. Also, opportunity for you to hang out with the, with the students. And the reason why it's so important is the fact uh, that they will see you differently, not just a, a county commissioner or a mayor or a leader in the community. They will look at you like, well, this is my friend, this is my coach. And the whole key to all of that, they have an open dialogue for maybe one day when there is a crime in a community, you'll be able to tell your coach, but it might be a sheriff officer, that this is what happened. You know, so it's really good dialogue. Um, if it helped me in my life, because like I said, I went from a point where I really didn't believe in law enforcement officers or didn't trust them to a point now that I really do trust them. Um, so, but that happens, that happens over the years of this dialogue. So five weeks of us getting closer to each other, five weeks of us learning more about each other, on all, all phases of our lives, you know, get a chance for us to plant some seeds that might be seeds that we might need to, uh, to look at later on in life as we got closer together. So uh, it has worked in my life. I truly believe that it will work in students' lives. Um, seven years ago, when I met uh, Officer Meadows, the post, uh, chief of police in Noonan, I told him that every event that I do, every practice that I do, every seminar that I do, every session that I have, I want law enforcement officers involved. At first, the students were like, oh my God, why are the police officers here? Now they hang out together, they talk together, they see each other, they wave, they hug each other. And I've seen it happen in my group of kids. If it happened with them, it can happen with other kids. So that's what we want to do. We want to expand what we already started. We want to expand the foundation we started for more kids in our community to know that law enforcement officers, for the most part, really, really want to help you. Uh, of course, in every profession, Preachers, law enforcement officers, whatever it is, you're going to have some bad seeds. We know that. But we want to keep the dialogue going that we really need them. They really need us. And at the end of the day, they can go home safely and our students can go home safely as well. How how wonderful how wonderful is that? And for for our church to to be able to get to, to partner with that is wonderful. You know, if you were tuning in last week with us, we, we continue this talk of just uh, Jesus, in, 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 central to his work on the cross was not just our personal forgiveness, but this reconciling work that Jesus was doing to bring uh, the systems of our world under the rule of the kingdom of God and to, to, to unite peoples in our world. And a few months ago, we started talking about the importance of racial justice and, and racial reconciliation in our world, and how core that is to what Jesus is doing. And all of this that Derek's talking about, man, that just fits right in the middle of what we as a church want to do. And if you remember last week, you were challenged. What are you going to do about this? Not what just are we as a church going to give money to, or what are we just going to go uh, do collectively as a church? But what could you do? Here is an opportunity for you to do that. You could be a coach. You could be a referee. You could be someone who serves a meal and just hangs out with students and loves them and says, hey, I notice you, I care about you, I, I want to be involved in your life. And what a difference uh, Derek and Empowered for Life is making, what a difference you could make. So here's the deal. If you want to be involved with this, you're sold on it, and you're like, Nathan, shut up because I want to do something about it. Let me tell you what you do. Uh, I'm Right now on the screen, you'll see Derek's phone number right there. You can text Derek right now and, and tell him, hey, I go to community. Christian and I want to help and Derek uh, will will get in touch with you and help you figure out what is your next step to uh, helping out with his ministry there. Uh, Derek, I got to tell you, man, uh, we are so thankful as a church for your willingness to partner with us in this and uh, just for all that you're doing for the kingdom and for uh, for these young men and women here in Coweta County. What, what a blessing you are, man. Thank you. Uh, absolutely.